Hello and welcome to our Sunday evening service and we're happy to have each of you join us online and we're thankful for each and every one of you and we ask that you continue to keep the ministry here in prayer, keep our pastor in prayer as he continues to regain his strength, pray for our staff and our leadership as we're getting geared up for the school year to start and excited to see what God uh, is going to do and has already been doing. And uh, we also want to be sure we're in prayer for one another and uh, just thank, uh, thankful for each and every one of you. And uh, if there's any way that we can be a help to you, if there's any way that we can uh, pray for you or assist you, please feel free to contact the office, contact us through Facebook. We would love to connect with you and be a help in any way that we can. Uh, tonight, I'd like you to take your Bibles and go to the book of 1 Samuel. Book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. You know, it's uh, the sad to say the summertime is coming to the end. Summer is my favorite season of the year, spring and summer. And I love the weather. I personally love hot weather. Uh, I do not like cold weather all that much, except for at Christmas time, it's perfect. So if maybe that week or so of Christmas, it's cold. After that, it needs to be warm all year long, which is why most of us live here in California. And one of the greatest things about hot weather is ice cream. Now in my house, uh, we typically have at least one container of ice cream in our freezer all year long. And there are many different flavors of ice cream that people enjoy. Uh, there's the holy trinity of ice cream, which would be your chocolate, your vanilla, and your strawberry. Those are the classics there. But there are so many other flavors. My personal favorite has always been chocolate and peanut butter. Now, I don't like peanut butter cups in there because they get too hard. I like the creamy peanut butter inside. Always been a personal favorite of mine. For my wife, she loves mint chip. Lately, we have grown attached to pecan praline. It is fantastic. I have zero idea what a praline is, but it is good. And so I'm sure that many of you have your own favorite flavors of ice cream. When you think about ice cream, you think about how often we use it to help people feel better. Think about it, you got your tonsils taken out, you got to eat ice cream. Had a bad day at school, let's go get some ice cream. Fell off your bike, hey, let's go get some ice cream. Ice cream just makes everything better. My first day of school every year as a kid, we would go get ice cream right after. So I always looked forward to that first day of school. Now the rest of the days, eh, not so much. But that first day had ice cream, so it was always good. You think about it, everyone loves the sweetness of ice cream. And when it comes to our relationship with God, there is a sweetness to knowing God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we meet a person by the name of Hannah. Hannah uh, is not a very, uh, does not have a lot written about her in Scripture. In fact, there's only about two chapters with her in it. Hannah's prayer will seem familiar to those who have ever read or studied Mary's prayer of praise when she finds out she's going to give birth to Jesus. And Hannah here has gone through a trying time. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we find that Hannah longs for a child. Her husband, Elkanah, loves her very much, but Hannah is barren. And so Elkanah takes a second wife by the name of Penina that he can have children with, and he does. Penina became the rival of Hannah, taunting her, tormenting her with the fact that Hannah could not have children. And so Hannah goes to the tabernacle with her family, as she did every year. She puts her worship before her worries. And she goes to God and says, God, if you give me a man-child, I will give him back to you. And she wasn't playing, let's make a deal, God, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It was, God, I want a child that I can glorify you with. And God gives her that child. His name is Samuel. His, Samuel's name means heard from God, because God literally heard the prayer of Hannah. Hannah then takes Samuel, around three years old when he was weaned, and takes him to the tabernacle to live there with Eli. And Hannah gives up the one thing she desired the most. But as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, we find that her response is not sorrow or anger, it's praise. Because for Hannah, she realized how sweet it is to know God. And tonight, as we look in 1 Samuel chapter 2, let us look at three attributes of God that will help us realize how sweet it is to know him. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse number 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. Let's have a word of prayer as we learn about how sweet it is to know our God. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time to be in your word. I thank you for our church. I thank you for our pastor, our leadership. God, I thank you for how good you are to us all the time. Lord, I pray as we take a few moments in your word that, God, you would strengthen our relationship with you. 
I pray if there's one watching today who has maybe become worried or discouraged or frustrated, that God, you would help them see life through your lens and understand that no matter what difficulty they face, when they have you, every di difficulty has a tint of sweetness because of their relationship with you. God, I pray if there's one here who's wondering, do I really believe in God? Or one here that's wondering, is giving my all to the Lord, is trusting Jesus, who is God, as my Savior really worth it? I pray today, through your word, you would convince them of that fact, that it is so sweet to know you. So God, bless our time together. We thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hannah is praising God, and in these ten verses, Hannah reveals three attributes of God. And the first that she reveals in verses 1 through 3 is God's supremacy. We read verse 1. Let's look at verse number 2. It says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You see, Hannah had just given up the most important thing in her life as her son. And yet her relationship with, with God was so strong and so valuable to her that she could praise. Uh, uh, one commentator said, the world doesn't understand the relationship between sacrifice and song. How God's people can sing their way into sacrifice and sacrifice their way into singing. And Hannah begins to praise the supremacy of God and she uses some different phrases here. In verse number one, she says, Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. The word horn is also often used as a symbol of strength. Uh, in battle, they would blow a horn as signals for attack and defense. Uh, animals that had horns, like a ram's horn, they would use that to defend themselves and to attack their enemies. And so horns were often used as symbols of strength. The mouth being enlarged refers to literally devouring one's enemies. For Hannah, her enemy was Penina, who tormented her day and night over the fact she couldn't have children. And the Bible teaches us through Hannah's praise that she had received victory over her barrenness, not because she handled the situation on her own, but because she went to God with it, and because God is supreme. In verse 2, it says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. You see, God's uniqueness adds to his supremacy. He is the one holy one. He is the only one true God. So often, even as Christians, we will allow things to become idols in our lives. Uh, sometimes it's sports. Sometimes it's politics or news. Sometimes it's finances and personal goals and pursuits that slowly take the place of God. And though we still will come to church and maybe attend a Bible study, perhaps those uh, different activities, maybe a relationship kind of takes precedence over God. And we no longer serve just our one master, we now serve many masters. And they tend to take the place of God. You see, an idol is anything we spend the majority of our time thinking with or engaged with. And for many of us, it's easy to slip into a subtle form of idolatry. But we must remember our God is supreme. That everyone we know, every relationship we're in, everything we do must be subservient to the supremacy of God. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You see, Hannah knew that God was supreme in her life, that the supremacy of God outshone every difficulty she faced. You see, the rock that she speaks of uh, in verse number two at the very end is a symbol of strength and stability. It represents the unchanging nature of God. We can rely on him totally. We can trust him implicitly. We can lean on him eternally. In verse three, Hannah praises God's knowledge and discernment. 
The Lord is omniscient, meaning he knows all. It says he is the very source of all knowledge. If you look again in 1 Samuel 2 and 3, it says, Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him all actions are are, are weighed. You see, God's supremacy is so amazing that the very knowledge we have is evidence of his creation. The very creation we have is evidence that he is the designer. Our God is supreme in all things. He is the very source of knowledge. And as our culture rapidly tries to find its knowledge outside of God, they become increasingly more confused. But if we're not careful, we can also leave behind God's supremacy and rely totally on the knowledge of the world. And because it's so devoid of the source of knowledge, it becomes confusing over and over again. You see, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. In Isaiah 40 verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. Our God is supreme in power, and our God is supreme in knowledge. You see, the supremacy of God ought to be the filter through which we view all of life's problems. Hannah had endured a long struggle both externally with not having children and emotionally wrestling with that same fact. Yet the struggle was placed in the context of God's supremacy and led to prayer, victory, and praise. You see, when we see the greatness of God, we start to see life in perspective. Hannah knew the character of God and exalted his glorious attributes. Filter every difficulty through God's supremacy and realize you don't have to figure it all out on your own. You're trying to pay that bill with as much work and and money as you can make. Allow God's supremacy to reign and know that he can help you. You're waiting for that relationship to kind of get started, to know what God's next step is for your life. Remember, God is supreme. He is in total control. And that leads us to our next point. Because in verses 4 through 8, Hannah then praises God's sovereignty. In verse number 4, it says, The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry... Uh, they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren was born, uh, has born seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory." You see, she praises God's supremacy, and now she praises God's sovereignty. Being sovereign means God has complete control and is directly involved in the affairs of men. There are some that believe that God did create the earth and the universe, just kind of let it spin on its own and took a back seat to kind of watch what happens. There are others that maybe they wouldn't say it out loud, but their actions and attitudes lead us to believe that they think God has just kind of abandoned everything. But you must understand that our God is in complete control. Our God is sovereign. And the Bible teaches us in 4 and 5 that Hannah exalts the fact that God can turn any situation upside down. He takes the mighty soldier and renders him weaponless. He then takes the one who has stumbled and fallen and equips him with strength. He can take the one who has every provision and place him in need of work and at the same time fill the belly of the starving. In this past year and a half, we have seen so many institutions turn completely upside down and what people had originally put their faith in, uh, with the exception of putting their faith in God, was completely taken away from them. And this past year and a half is a wonderful reminder of the sovereignty of our God, that he is in control. In verses 6 through 8, it teaches us the Lord is sovereign over life, death, and the in-between. He can rescue us from the grave, or he can call us home at any time. He can, uh, in life, he can allow us access to wealth or carry us through poverty. He can abase our position to a low degree or exalt us to the highest extent allowed. He can rescue us from financial ruin and place us in a position of royalty. Our God is sovereign. 
In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, and 12, it says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, God's sovereignty doesn't mean that we don't have free will or responsibility. If we aren't careful, we may get the idea that we can either do whatever we want or there's no sense in trying since God will do whatever he wants anyway. There's there's two extremes to God's sovereignty. We either look at it and say, well, I don't have to do anything because God's just going to do it all. And so we do nothing for the Lord. We do nothing to reach this world for Christ. On the other hand, we can take it and say, Uh, Well, if God is in complete control, I can just do whatever I want. I can live however I want. It doesn't matter my sin. It doesn't matter what I go out there and do or what I say. God's going to take care of it no matter what, so it's not a big deal. And both are wrong views of God's sovereignty. Both are imbalanced. When it comes to God's sovereignty, we've got to understand, yes, God is in control. Yes, God is directly involved in the affairs of men. But in his sovereignty, he allows us free will to function with or without him. God allows us the free will to choose to follow him and reap the reward or to choose to abandon him and reap the consequences. And so God being sovereign, Hannah knew that God was in complete control. And she viewed her barrenness in light of God's supremacy and his sovereignty. She knew that if God wants me to have a child because I can physically and emotionally and spiritually do nothing about my situation, that God has to be in complete control. And yes, there are commands in Scripture that we are responsible for, and there are responsibilities we have within our church, as we even heard this morning in in the preaching time, that we are to be an owner of the church, not just a renter. We are to be directly involved and engaged in the work of God, that we are called, we are saved to serve, not saved to sit. And yet we must understand those areas that we have no control over. Our God is sovereign. See, if we look at our personal situation this last year and a half, absent of God's sovereignty, take a look at everything that happened politically, economically, uh, financially, uh, uh, through our health care system, all of that. Take a look at all of that and remove it from the sovereignty of God. And all we see is chaos. All we see is worry. All we see is corruption. All we see is failed leadership. All we see is sickness and death. That's what it is. That's all there is, absent of God's sovereignty. But take all of that and filter it through the sovereignty of God. And what you see is order in the chaos. You see power in the sickness. You see comfort in death. We see his protection during their corruption. His leading hand in spite of their failed leadership. And peace and comfort during times of frustration and sorrow. Every health, financial, political crisis, personal difficulty is almost unbearable unless we view it in light of the sovereignty of God. And we can remember, while I am responsible for my relationship with the Lord, I am responsible to lead my family, I am responsible to reach others for Christ and to grow in my walk with Christ, I am responsible to serve within my local church, that God is in control and I don't have to do it all by myself. I don't have to figure out every difficulty. When things don't go my way, I don't have to go and figure it all out. I have a God who's in control. And when I don't understand what's going on, he does. See, Hannah praised the supremacy of God. Hannah praised the sovereignty of God. But let's look finally that she praises God's stability. In verses number 8 through 10, at the very end of verse 8, it says, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. You see, Hannah lived in a time of constant instability when it came to childbearing. This was probably made even worse every time Penina had another child. Yet in a time of volatility with her relationships, she found stability with God. 
In verse uh, 8, it talks about pillars. And pillars, most of us know, are a structural piece. But they were extremely important in Bible days. I mean, we use pillars today. We have pillars holding up our, our overhangs here on the outside and the back patio. We don't rely so much on pillars as they did in Bible days. If you were to go into ancient Greece and Rome, and, and during that particular time and even further back, pillars were a huge architectural marvel. If you know the, the uh, account of Samson, that the house of the Philistines, it was a, a rather large building. It was probably the common house for the Philistines because the Bible says there were several thousand Philistines there. It was held up by two large pillars that held everything together. And when Samson pushes on those pillars and God gives him his strength back, he knocks those pillars down, causing the whole house to collapse. You see, pillars were a symbol of strength and stability. It made things almost immovable and stable. You see, the earth we live on has not been abandoned by our God on high. He created it and holds it together. And by the way, whatever he has called you to, he will hold together as well as we rely on him. You see in Job chapter 26 and verse 7 it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Our God is that pillar of strength. In verse number 9, it says he will keep the feet of his saints. To keep means to guard. It means he will literally protect the movements of those who are following him. Literally, God will direct us. He will protect us. And it goes on to say that he will ultimately silence the wicked in darkness and leave them to wander. You see, no matter how strong the wicked seem to get or believe that they are, God is far more powerful. In Psalm 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song I will praise him. We live in a world where, quite frankly, wickedness seems to be getting stronger and stronger. And it shouldn't surprise us. Our world is lost. The people in leadership, for the most part, are lost. Those leading our public school systems, many of them are lost. So when they, when they push out wicked ideas, understand they're only doing what they know. And we need to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to have compassion and make a difference and get out there and show them the truth of the gospel in love. But when there are people that just deliberately reject Christ, and there are many, and those people seem to be stronger, just understand that God is right there guiding and protecting the feet of his saints and that he will leave them to wander in their darkness and confusion. You think about our world today and you think about our culture and it's confused about gender identity, it's confused about their religious identity, and yet there is such stability in knowing our God. But sometimes we don't live like it. Our stress and our own confusion are many times a result of forgetting to rely on the stability of God. In verse number 10, it says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. You see, God's going to take care of that judgment in the end. Our role is, yes, to call out sin when necessary. Our goal, our number one role is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and see them saved and changed. The judgment will come in the end from God himself. I don't have to seek it now. But I want you to notice the end of verse 10. It says, And he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The last part of this verse is pretty heavy. You see, Israel had no king at this point. Yet God had made provision for the day they would have a human king. But ultimately, this promise is not just given to their future human king. It's a prophecy about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy that the anointed one, the one that God, the Father, will ultimately give all strength to is Jesus Christ, the Son. And you see, Hannah may not have completely understood this, but what Hannah was saying under inspiration of the Holy Ghost is say, hey, ultimately all of this, the stability, the supremacy, the sovereignty is going to be wrapped up in one person that is King Jesus. And that is our Savior. You see, instability has become the norm in our society. It's ever-changing as the world seeks pleasure, power, and provision outside of God's power and presence. 
Our country being a post-Christian nation, heading further and further away from the Lord at a rapid pace. And genuine stability is not found in financial investments, religious establishments, or a political party. It is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now we started our lesson tonight talking about ice cream. That is a great way to start, and that's a great way to end. There is one flavor of ice cream that is unique to all others. Because it brings three of the most loved flavors together. The chocolate, strawberry, the vanilla. We call it Neapolitan. Now, for some Neapolitan eaters, they go heavy on the chocolate and just give me a little bit of the other stuff. Others, a little heavy on the vanilla and give me whatever. But when I eat Neapolitan ice cream, I must evenly distribute the chocolate, the vanilla, and the strawberry. As in, when I take my scooper, I make sure that I am getting about the same amount in each scoop. And when I eat it, so this takes me a while, when I eat it, I try to be sure that I have an even amount of each flavor on my spoon. I want all three at the same time as the Lord has intended this ice cream to be eaten. And when you think about the sweetness of knowing God, God's sovereignty, God's supremacy, God's stability. When we have a relationship with Christ, we get all three. We get each of them at the same time. So no matter what you're going through right now, and maybe it's nothing big, maybe it's extremely huge, no matter what you're going through, take it and place it within the context of God's supremacy, God's sovereignty, and God's stability. Because if you have a relationship with Christ, you have all three of those that you have direct access to. And when you filter all of life's situations through that lens, it becomes a whole lot sweeter. And tonight, if maybe you don't have a relationship with the Lord, maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that God in heaven loves you, that he created you, but you're a sinner. All of us are sinners. We are all have, we've all done wrong, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That, that sin separates us from God, and that sin has a punishment because God is just and holy and perfect. He must punish sin. That punishment is separation from God forever in a place called hell. And yet God made a way out when he sent his son Jesus, God literally in the flesh, who was perfect, who never sinned, and so could pay for your sin and mine, who died and rose again. And that same Jesus rose from the dead, was seen of over 500 witnesses, some, over 500 at the same time, not to mention the disciples and others that followed him, and has ascended to heaven and is alive forevermore, sitting on the throne of heaven, and will one day return for those who have trusted him. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior tonight, you can decide to put your faith and trust in him and him alone. Not baptism, not a church, not a prayer, Jesus. If you make that decision, you can pray right now and ask him to be your savior. Because when you have Jesus, you have God. When you have God, you have his supremacy, you have his sovereignty, and you have his stability 24-7. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for being supreme. I thank you for being sovereign. I thank you for being stable, never changing. And God, I pray tonight, if there's one that's never trusted you as Savior, that tonight would be the night they do so. But I pray for your children, Lord, those who have trusted you, that you would help us to view life through your stability, your sovereignty, your supremacy, and remember how sweet it is to know you. And God, I pray you'd help us to grow in that relationship, because the more we know about you and the closer we draw to you, Lord, the better life seems to get. So God, we pray you'd help us tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank each and every one of you again for joining us for this Bible study. And we pray that the Lord would bless you. We pray that uh, you would be able to begin filtering life through this lens and realize how sweet it is to know God. If there's any way we can be a help or a blessing to you, please feel free to contact us. You can contact the church. Contact us, contact us through Facebook. Uh, you can send us an email as well, and we'd love to be a help to you in any way we can. 
We pray God's blessing upon you. We'll see you all Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our growth groups here on campus. And for those of you that join us online, we'll see you then as well. Have a wonderful night.